What up space fam goes in here from anime up pro and I have a brand new seven deadly sins video for you today This topic is special because it was one of the first seven deadly sins topics we ever covered However, that was a few years ago and a lot has changed since then So with the manga series being over I thought it was the perfect time to do a revamped and updated version of the video before we get started I want to give a big thank you to guardian tales for sponsoring this video guardian tales is a classic action adventure RPG with adorable pixel graphics and I really fell in love with this game when I first tried it out. It is extremely fun and easy to get into, the controls are smooth and simple and even the tutorial was fun to play. The game features lots of action, awesome sword and magic combos, more than 50 characters and over 200 unique pieces of equipment. You can play single player story mode, multiplayer mode including real time PvP and 4 player co-op raids, tower and dungeon mode and more. You can join guilds, create your own floating castle where you can place buildings and structures that generate wealth over time. And you can collect powerful weapons and beautiful warrior waifus. I love the gameplay, the chibi pixel graphics, and the overall classic feel of the game that brings me right back to my childhood. This game is honestly a breath of fresh air in the modern gaming landscape. Try it for yourself, just click the link in the description and start playing for free right now. It's a super fun action packed way to pass the time so check it out link in the description now without further ado let's jump into it spoilers and all first up we have the 750 year old and 30 feet tall Deanne our favorite giant queen. Matrona always thought that Deanne had the potential to become the strongest warrior of the entire giant clan and she was right. Now let's highlight some of her feats here. Deanne uses a 2,200 pound war hammer as a weapon, illustrating how insanely strong she is. Gideon, which is the name of her sacred treasure, works in conjunction with her creation ability, allowing her to use it to its full potential. Creation is pretty much earth bending. It capitalizes on the giant clan's connection to the earth. Creation lets her turn solid earth to quicksand, create flow floating mountains of earth and drop them down on her opponents, create giant spikes that jut out of the earth, launch rocks at opponents and so on. So yeah, she's pretty much like the most OP earthbender you can imagine. She can even create golems from the earth that can fight for her. Near the end of the series, she can produce seemingly diamond based attacks like Diamond Tower, which should be significantly more powerful than normal earthen ones. As queen of the giant clan, Deanne even gets strong enough to help during the fight against the demon king. And when he's in Zeldris's body, she manages to cut him off from his supply of magic by creating a new platform beneath their feet high above the magic lake. Deanne can increase her powers by using Droll's Dance, and she can also use Heavy Metal, an interesting move where, as the name suggests, she turns her body into metal, thereby increasing its weight, strength, and defense. In one data book that came out before the series finished, Deanne's power level was set to be 50,000. So even if we don't know her exact power level by the end of the series, it should at the very least be classified as 50,000 plus. Next, let's look at Gother, the Goat Sin of Lust. This over 3,000 year old doll has many abilities under his belt. Gother is not just any doll though. He was created by one of the greatest wizards in history. He was created so well that even the very talented Merlin admitted that she couldn't improve him. Since he's a doll, Gother is practically immortal compared to other life forms. He can be rebuilt from the most serious of wounds that would kill practically anyone else and he doesn't age. You can cut off his head and he'll just put it back on. Gother has some superficial doll powers like being able to change the shape and color of his hair. But his real OP ability is called Invasion, which pretty much allows him to use Genjutsu or Mind Control on his targets. He can read people's minds and memories, but that's only the beginning. He can also erase and rewrite memories, or trap people inside an illusion, leaving them motionless and defenseless. Gother can also enter someone's mind and communicate with their subconscious, but in this case, his own body would be left motionless and defenseless. He uses his sacred treasure, Herit, in conjunction with this ability. It's a magical bow made out of energy that lets him use his invasion ability from a much longer range. He was even able to use his sacred treasure to render anyone within a 3 mile radius who had a spirit level below 400 unconscious. Another ability revealed near the end of the series was that Gother has a self destruction device inside him. Merlin made it using magic extract from Escanor Sunshine and added the 4 elements of destruction to it and then threw in some of her own magic infinity to maximize the destructive power. 
Thus, this is an OP cocktail made up of sunshine maximized to infinity and extra destruction thrown in for good measure. This last resort attack is so strong that it should be able to obliterate any and all living things within a 10 mile radius of Gother. Gother's largest recorded power level was 35,400 after he regained his memories. And in all honesty, I did probably expect to see some further power level upgrades from Gother because pretty much everyone else got them, but we didn't really get to see that. As a perfectly constructed doll, his power growth might have a certain limit on it, but still the fact that his self-destruct power is arguably one of the strongest and deadliest moves in the Seven Deadly Sins manga means that he can at least get a tie against almost everyone in the series. Next we got Merlin, the genius behind the ultimate self-destruct cocktail. Merlin is an alias and her true name cannot be pronounced by humans. And I know I said it before, but I'm so glad that they turned an old male wizard from Arthurian legend into a hot 30 year old looking woman. That is artistic license at its best right there. Merlin is the greatest wizard in all of Britannia. She defeated the commandment of pacifism Grey Road, who had a power level of 39,000 and was especially tricky because of her commandment. If one kills in Grey Road's presence, then all of their time is stolen from them. They age rapidly and die. Ordinarily, people wouldn't be able to kill Grey Road because of this, but Merlin is able to stop her own time with the help of her magic power infinity. Thus, she could kill in Grey Road's presence without anything happening to her. Merlin explains her infinity ability as follows. And I quote, No matter how powerful a magic is, all I need to do is invoke it just once. And I can keep flames burning, ice frozen, or time stopped for eternity. As long as I, myself, do not release the spell. End quote. This ability is so OP that everyone present during Merlin's explanation can't help but recognize how unfair it is. It's like cheating. She then proceeds to capture Grey Road and turns this feared, seemingly unbeatable commandment into her own personal guinea pig. Interestingly enough, Merlin's highest power level was 4. 4,710, but this is a pretty useless figure by the end of the series. Not only did she effortlessly turn a commandment with an almost 40,000 power level into her guinea pig, she also uses her magic to defeat the OP demons Chandler and Cusack, whose power levels were at least 173,000 and 168,000 respectively. But it's not just demons that she impresses. Ludoshell, the archangel, prays to himself that he never makes an enemy out of Merlin. Not to mention that she straight up managed to trick both the demon king and the supreme deity when she was a child without ever getting caught by them. From the Demon King, she got detailed info on all the secret arts and mysteries of the underworld and divine protection that could defend against the brainwashing of the goddesses. And from the Supreme Deity, she got divine protection able to nullify any and all manner of dark curses and commandments. She was supposed to choose one gift and join the leader's side, but she just took both and peaced out. Her sacred treasure is a crystal ball called Alden that she uses in conjunction with her spells. Among other abilities, she can channel spells through it, see distant locations with it, and even transfer her soul into it if need be. Since she's a wizard, she has access to a wide assortment of spells, some of which let her cancel other spells, amplify the magic of her friends, trap opponents within a cube that will reflect their attacks back at them, teleport, create illusions, and much more. Merlin can even reactivate the perpetual reincarnation curse that caused Elizabeth to be reincarnated every time she regained her memory and died. In addition to being able to let her allies draw out power beyond their limits, Merlin was able to fuse their attacks into a single ultra powerful attack and then Meliodas increased its power with a few full counters and used it to defeat the Demon King and end the Holy War. Zell just mentioned that this combined attack would have been able to completely level all of Britannia. Then she undid the work of the Supreme Deity and the Demon King, who worked together in the past to seal away their creator chaos. For 3000 years, Merlin patiently worked towards this goal and accomplished it, and managed to revive King Arthur as the King of Chaos at the same time. It was even her who was behind the Coffin of Eternal Darkness that sealed away the Demon King and the Supreme Deity. So I think her genius and masterminding has to be included in any discussion of her abilities. You can question her morals at times, but you definitely can question her genius. Next up we have the fairy king himself, King aka Harlequin. King goes on to become the most powerful fairy in history. In regards to superficial abilities, he can levitate and change his appearance. As a fairy, he also doesn't age, can read the true thoughts of others, and can't get sick. So all in all, being a fairy is a pretty good gig. Before we discuss his full grown wings power up, let's mention his power called Disaster. The ability is explained by Merlin as follows. A mere scratch becomes a grave wound. An ordinary poison can become a fatal toxin and so on. The power allows him as the fairy king to manage and rule over the plants and forests by exercising complete control over life and death." End quote. 
He can even turn a tiny water droplet extracted from a stick into a deadly weapon. By compressing it, he makes it as strong as an iron ball, and then he can control it telepathically, moving it at insane speeds. Furthermore, disaster lets King fully draw out the potential of his sacred treasure, Chastiful. And King arguably relies on his sacred treasure more than any other sin does. Chastiful is made from the sacred tree and its forms, become stronger as King does. In this video, we're going to be looking at some of its latest OP forms. Along with his large wings and Elvis hair, King also gains the ability to use multiple chastiful forms at a time. He can produce a powerful barrier that can easily protect people within it from Miles' attacks. The new and improved Guardian form is a giant buff bear with many arms that can launch a brutal onslaught of punches, strong enough to push around an enemy as strong as Mael. Then, with his fifth form increase, he can produce countless large swords and control them effortlessly, while simultaneously making them all travel at insane speeds. He can also now create a giant true spirit spear Chastiful that is so large it makes him look like a bug next to it. Definitely big PP energy. He can at the very least use four Chastiful forms at once, which is pretty crazy. He uses these powers to overpower the suffering Mael, who has absorbed four commandments by this point effortlessly. His highest recorded power level was 41,600, and that was when he still had tiny wings. But this is terribly outdated since he could easily beat Mael whose power level was already at 88,000 after one absorbed commandment, let alone after four. Next, let's look at the one, the only Escanor. His special ability is Sunshine, a grace that was originally bestowed onto the Archangel Mael by the Supreme Deity. With it, Escanor was at his weakest at midnight and at his strongest at noon. This was early on in the series, but Merlin did say that at his peak, Escanor easily surpasses every other sin. Escanor's body radiates immense heat in his daytime form, and as a result, anything around him will turn to ash. In this confident and buff form, he can even and melt stone. This is where his sacred treasure Rita comes in handy. The axe is incredibly heavy and unbalanced, but Escanor can still carry it effortlessly in his daytime form. The really special thing about Rita is that Escanor can store all of that heat and power that radiates from him inside of it. Then he can release all that stored power at once when he chooses to. Escanor can use the stored power to launch attacks or to turn into his daytime form at night. Interestingly enough, Escanor can also call the axe to himself, and it will travel at an incredible speed from wherever it happens to be straight to him. And then of course we gotta talk about the one form which Escanor can enter for only a minute at noon. He used this form, which is supposed to be the manifestation of power itself, to defeat both Meliodas and Zeldris in mere moments. He even uses the form to straight up duke it out with the Demon King in Zeldris' body. And he does quite well during that minute, while mentioning how the Demon King's blows are nothing more than an itch. But then the minute runs out and we think it's over. However, that's not what happens. Escanor then enters the one ultimate by converting his own life force to not only maintain but to enhance the one's already incredible power. It comes with a heavy price, shaving off Escanor's own life in the process, but the power lets him punch around the Demon King himself. Despite how well he's doing, the Sins won't let him go it alone, and they join in, eventually finishing the Demon King off together. Alas, Escanor burns through too much of his life force in the battle and passes away shortly afterwards, but temporarily, he had enough power to push around the God of Demons, which is absolutely insane to think about. Escanor's highest recorded power level was 114,000, which was shortly before noon. However, with the one, not to mention the one ultimate, we can rest assured that he far surpassed this power level by the end of the series. Next up, let's look at Bond the Bandit himself. His special ability, Snatch, is very fitting for a bandit. It lets him rob physical objects or even power from another person. He's used this ability to steal hearts from demons, but also to steal power, speed, and stamina from his opponents. In this way, Bond becomes stronger, better, and faster as the fight progresses, while his opponents become the opposite. However, it's not that simple. Earlier in the series, Bond could only absorb so much power, and it was because his body was not a very fit vessel. This changed when he spent centuries in purgatory and came back with one of the most durable bodies of all time. This was only possible because he was immortal and his body recovered from the harsh conditions of purgatory again and again until it eventually adapted. Bond could always take power, but in purgatory while fighting against the Demon King, Bond learned how to give power as well. When Bond came out of purgatory, he used this new ability and gave up his immortality for Elaine's life. 
so that she could keep on living alongside him. You might think that not being immortal would make Bond weaker, but it's definitely not the case. This series did a good job of showing how you can be immortal and still be powerless, which we saw when Bond couldn't stop Estarosa from killing Meliodas. But now, after the Purgatory upgrade, Bond is stronger than ever and his durability is so high that he might as well be immortal. Now let's take a look at Bond after Purgatory in action. The Demon King in Meliodas' body was really strong and completely overpowered the combined forces of the other Sins and the two strongest Archangels. Albeit King's magic was drained and Escanor was in his weaker nighttime form. Then post Purgatory Bond came to the rescue. He was quick enough to save Hawk from the Demon King before he could even react. When the Demon King creates an energy storm that no living creature could possibly withstand, Bond does and even comments how it's an adorable little breeze compared to Purgatory. He goes on to fight the Demon King one on one and holds his ground long enough for Meliodas to beat him from within. And it's even Bond who delivers the final satisfying punch to the Demon King before he leaves Meliodas' body. But not only did Bond do that well against the Demon King in Meliodas' body when practically no one else could, he's also fine afterwards and is ready to help fight the Demon King again after he takes over Zeldris' body. It is during this fight that Merlin returns Bond's sacred treasure, the Holy Staff Kurechos and he uses it in conjunction with his ability Super Concentration to destroy countless baby Indra, a feat no one else present could accomplish. His highest recorded power level was actually 3220, which is hilarious because he went on to become one of the strongest sins. The Purgatory boost was exactly what his epic character needed. And last but not least, we got Meliodas, our demonic captain himself. Meliodas became so strong, he had to be nerfed just to stay in the human realm, which is pretty epic. As we know, Meliodas was heir to become the next Demon King. And he did unlock powers equal to the godly Demon King. He could have taken on that role, but instead, he decided to sacrifice this godly power in order to destroy the Ten Commandments and, by extension, his father for good. As a result, he's not as strong as he was, but this allowed him to stay in Britannia with Elizabeth, which is way more important to him than having godly power. Now let's talk about some of Meliodas' specific abilities. He's most famous for Full Counter, which lets him reflect magic attacks back at his opponent with double the power. Sometimes he likes full countering an attack multiple times so that he can make it all the more powerful before directing it at his opponent. As mentioned earlier in this video, he can use full counter to amplify the combined attack of his allies as well. Meliodas can also use demon abilities like Hellblaze. When Meliodas used this ability, he was even able to leave a scar on the immortal Bond, something that never happened before. Meliodas also has his assault mode, and in this mode, he was said to have a power level of 142,000. This is the power he had when he was Meliodas of the Ten Commandments. Escanor's the one beat him in this form, but that being said, Meliodas recovered much quicker and took way less damage than Escanor. When he was fighting the Demon King to regain control of his body, he used the move Trillion Dark to launch countless spheres of concentrated darkness at the Demon King and the powerful attack in conjunction with Bond fighting the Demon King from the outside was enough to defeat him and free Meliodas' body. Meliodas' sacred treasure Lost Vein is a demon splitting sword that lets him make the most of full counter and also to create up to four clones of himself. Although clones are weaker than the original, they can still use full counter to the fullest, making them very effective against magic based attacks. And although there's always more to say, I think that does a good job of covering most of Meliodas' powers. He had godlike powers that he had to sacrifice in order to destroy the Demon King for good and still has considerable power remaining, suggesting that he was, at his peak, significantly stronger than the Demon King himself, who is legit a god in the Seven Deadly Sins world. And keep in mind, a much weaker Meliodas could easily wipe the entire kingdom of Danaphor off the face of the earth. So it's safe to say that we barely saw a fraction of the level of destruction that Demon King Meliodas was capable of. If he was a monster in the world of One Punch Man, he'd definitely be a god level threat. And that is it for this one. If you did enjoy this video and want to see more 7 Deadly Sins videos on this channel, then the best thing you could do is smash that like button and share this video with any men of culture that you know. If you haven't, be sure to subscribe and this is crucial. Hit that notification bell and select all or you will miss future 7 Deadly Sins videos. Now that the manga is over, I could revamp a lot of our videos, so if there's a specific video you'd like to see, let me know in the comments. And while you wait for the next video to drop, check out our giant 7 Deadly Sins playlist where you can find videos about the commandments, about every sin's power level, about every sin's backstory, and much, much more. 
link in the description. I also want to thank all of you because the channel has been growing faster than ever and it's unreal. We passed 900,000 subscribers and are actually approaching 1 million subscribers and it's all thanks to you guys. And I especially want to thank the patron squad over on Patreon who helped make videos like this one possible. First and foremost, I want to thank the patron of legend, the one acknowledged by Lord Twigo himself, Alpha Sigma, and are the one tier patrons, the ones who stand atop all clans, Steven Ingrata, Alola and Atem, the world, acquired respect, but they have a Jonathan Kang, Brandon of Isles, Papa Smurf, Emperor Otaku, Thomas Jones, Kin Mano, and Admirath. And our Pro Hero tier patrons, the one and only Gilgamesh, who's the current most donated overall champion of the world, nothing but a fan, Jason Wilson, King Zeldris, Anatoly Kazatsky, Angel Cruz, Cricket XP, Joe Stanton, Barry Gucci, Alicia Actor, Jessica K. LaFont, Hinokami and Water, Bonnie Parks, Rathu and De Aura, Florian, Joanne, Garcia, Steelers, Deadly Saint, and Stern Hawkins. Thank you all so much. If you enjoy our work, you can support more of it by going over to patreon.com slash anime uproar and becoming a patron today for as little as one dollar. If you do so, you'll get your name featured in future videos alongside these amazing people right here. And you'll even get access to our private patron-only discord where we talk about anime, life, and of course, dank memes. So check out patreon.com slash anime uproar, link in the description if you are interested. You can also join the YouTube channel by clicking that blue join button next to the subscribe button that you've hopefully already destroyed. So yeah, you can support more content that way if you prefer, whichever way you choose to support us, you can get the same great benefits. Thank you all again so much, and until next time, see ya, Space Cowboys.